I want you to hear something, and then I'll uh, get into the uh, talking. This is a crude way of doing this, but I didn't have time to get this thing set up the way I should have. But anyway, you'll hear what I'm talking about. the words out to that or not <coughs> how many is that how many is that the first time you ever heard that well let me ask it this way who's ever heard that before it is the unofficial <coughs> national anthem of Great Britain now let me read the words for you listen carefully and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green and was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Now does it make sense? Start connecting the dots and you'll begin to understand what I'm talking about when I talk about British Israelism. Now that's beautiful music. <laughs> Believe me, I could have done a better job of recording it and what you've got there, the reason it's breaking up is because the compressor and uh, the volume's too loud, <coughs> but I just had to get it done before I got over here this morning. I wanted you to hear it. It's like, it's like a picture that's worth a thousand words. Uh, if you want to do this when you get home this afternoon, just Google Jerusalem Hymn and pull up Westminster Abbey, and you'll see the Queen of England. You'll see the whole royalty, all of them, gathered together in, in, inside the Westminster, which is a beautiful place playing that. And uh, 
The reason, of course, is because they believe, not, I'm not saying all of them believe this, but they believe, many of them believe, that uh, Great Britain is the seat of the throne of David right now. And the coronation stone that at, for, at one time resided in Westminster Abbey for hundreds of years, the kings and queens of England were sworn in, uh, coronated, sitting on that seat with that coronation stone underneath, which was supposed to be the stone that Jacob called Bethel in the book of Genesis, the house of God, and was carried all the way to Great Britain. Now, of course, what happens when you, when you, when you, uh, when you do something like that? I mean, you, you need to get a hold of, the, of what's going on. Listen to this. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. What is that? That's militancy. That's war. That's going about, setting about to establish a kingdom. Where? Where they're going to build Jerusalem? Above, which is the mother of us all, which is free? No. Right here on this earth. You remember I told you how that your eschatology, your doctrine of last things, will affect your politics. It's going to affect your, uh, it's going to affect your national identity. It's going to affect all these things as how you see the purpose of the church in this world. I'm premillennial. I believe the church is here to, to uh, preach the gospel of Christ until Christ himself comes again. But we are not going to convert this world and we are not going to build his kingdom on this earth. And this is why it's so necessary. It's so absolutely necessary to differentiate Matthew, Mark, and Luke from John. They are not the same. They're talking about the same person, but the application is entirely different. The dispensation in John falls in an entirely different period of time than Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have to do with the kingdom of heaven on this earth with the king offering himself to the Jewish people. They reject him. The Gospel of John picks it up 90 A.D. and carries it to where you are right now. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. What Gospel is that in? Is that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? You can look in vain to find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not there. It's in John. And the reason it's in John is because the Gospel of John is not about building a kingdom. The Gospel of John is written that you might believe and believing having everlasting life. That's what it's about. So British Israelism and the Masonic Lodge are directly connected with each other. And the seat of the Masonic Lodge is not America. The seat of the Masonic Lodge is Great Britain. And so when you go to England, if you ever go, it's a wonderful trip. It's a beautiful place. Folks, I've been there. I've been to countries, and I've seen how the people live. And, uh, you know, all the, you can read all the books in the world, and you'll find out that most, most stuff is done according to an agenda. They don't want to be criticized, so they fit within the fit within the mold, but you go to Great Britain and you'll find one of the cleanest countries on earth. You can drive through the countryside and the farmer's fields are manicured practically compared to, you can drive around here, what do you see? And you go to some, you go to some foreign countries and I'm telling you right now, the garbage is piled as high as you can walk and they live in that stuff. People are not the same. But in any event, when you go to Great Britain, you find people who have a strong national heritage, very strong, very strong. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm saying that in observation. But you go to London and you'll go to the square. It's in, I think it's in front of the uh, uh, Westminster, uh, what's that palace called? In, uh, uh, in, in, uh, I forget the name of the palace. One where the guard, the changing of the guard, and they watch that. Buckingham, Buckingham, you go there. Right close to Buckingham Palace, you'll find a huge monument to Queen Victoria. And the reason it's so huge and the reason it's so uh, British people are so proud of Queen Victoria is because she was the queen over the British Empire where the sun never set. And they were realizing on this earth their identity as bringing about the new Jerusalem and ruling and reigning over men to the ends of the earth. 
And the British Empire did that. They built their empire from sea to shining sea all the way around the globe. Somebody had gone down to the Caribbean the other day and came back and said, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. I said, Great Britain. <laughs> Great Britain. When they first started driving cars, you know, they got together and said, now which side are we going to drive on? You better figure it out <laughs> or you get in trouble. So they have, uh, they have uh, taken literally the idea that we are going to expand and extend this empire. You, uh, there's quite a bit of a debate between uh, Winston Churchill, who had an American mother and British father, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, they, of course, were allies in World War II, but they didn't agree on the empire. And Winston Churchill said plainly, yes, sir, we are the British speak English speaking people. We are here to build an empire on this earth. And of course, uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, didn't agree with that because he was the president of a sovereign nation. So it goes, the empire and the British Israelism. So do you believe that the English speaking people, now you have to make this decision on your own. You have to decide when you do your own study, read it and determine for yourself. Do you believe the English speaking people have replaced Israel? Do you believe that the uh, 10 Northern tribes no longer have any identity, that they don't matter, that uh, we are the new Jerusalem, that uh, we will build the kingdom of God on this earth and do it if by necessary by the sword? That sounds like the Muslim to me, doesn't it? But, uh, but that's the idea. I'm not. I'll just make that plain to you this morning. I am not a British Israelite. Or can you be a British Israelite and be saved? Absolutely. You can be messed up on you can be messed up on eschatology. You can be messed up on church polity. You can be messed up on you can be in the wrong political party. <laughs> you can you can be messed up on a lot of things, <laughs> and still go to heaven if you've got Christ right. Amen. You get him wrong, you can have all the rest of it right as far as men are concerned. You're not going. There's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's important to remember that. All right. Now, so we've got, uh, you've got a little bit of an idea of what British Israelism is about. And uh, as I say once again, uh, the, the many, 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 many of these people who believe this are good people. They'd give you the shirt off their back. They're Christian people. Uh, but uh, the idea that, uh, that the church has replaced Israel is dead wrong. As far as I'm concerned, so you have to uh, you have to look at it. Uh, you have to make your own decision. The things that I believe, I didn't reach. I didn't come to these conclusions overnight. It didn't happen overnight. Now, how many's ever heard the Hebrew Roots movement? Hebrew Roots, okay. Hebrew Roots. Now, where did the Church of God come from? Did we come from paganism? Did we come from the Muslims? Obviously they didn't even exist, but from the Arab world? Did we come from a mixture of uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all? Where did we come from? Okay. We came from the Jews. And our faith is the consummation of the prophecy and promise of the coming Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. Not a Gentile Messiah, but a Jewish Messiah. Does that mean that we have strong roots to the Jews? Absolutely. You cannot cut the Jew out of the faith that we have this day. For, for one thing, our Lord Jesus Christ was a Jew. The Bible said in John 1, He came into His own. He was the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. The, the fourth born, his name means praise. The Lord Jesus Christ was a Jew. Now, uh, British Israelism will tell you that Jew is, a, is, a, is a, a term that only refers to the two southern tribes, or to the, or to the, to the uh, two southern tribes, and that, uh, that uh, they are the true Israel of God. See, the true Israel of God. And uh, so therefore, when the, word, when the Bible uses the term Jew, it's using in the sense of a apostate, pagan-oriented, uh, affected by the Talmud, affected by, 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 by paganism. And therefore, it is an anti-God an anti and anti-Christ religion. See, the term Jew. 
They like to do that. And the reason they do that is because what they've done is pit one against another. Now, folks, the Apostle Paul said that I profited in the Jews' religion. All right. Now, uh, what tribe was Paul from? Benjamin. Benjamin. Okay, he was the tribe of Benjamin. Who were the two tribes that, uh, that had Jerusalem? Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah. Judah and Benjamin. The Lord Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Asher. No. Naphtali. Gad. Judah. Judah. All right. They got a problem with that. This is why so many of them teach that he's not even a Jew. And so, you know, you get into all kinds of spinoffs and problems with this, and you can develop into a mess with it. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about an Israelite, and has God cast away his people, which he foreknew? No, he hasn't cast them away. God intends to save his people. Make no mistake about that. And he knows every last one of them, and he knows every tribe that they belong to. In Revelation 7, Revelation 14, it names the tribes of Israel. And among these names are the so-called lost tribes. So they're there. All right. Now you have all kinds of spinoffs and all kinds of movements, and these movements come along because most of the time people have a, have a personal motive. Not necessarily that they, that they desire to teach and preach the truth. They've got a personal motive. The Hebrew Roots Movement is the idea that Gentiles, that's us, are still goyim, pagan, and the only way we'll ever understand anything about God is for one of them in their movement to explain these Hebrew things to us because they are still binding upon us. So what I did was a little research into the Messianic movement, and it's a little, not a whole lot, but a little. And a Messianic Jew is a Jew that believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah, Mashiach. All right. The Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah simply means the anointed one. We use the word Christ all the time, and that means the same thing, Christos, Christ, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, or the Christ. They believe that he's the Messiah. Now that's a wonderful thing. It's great to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It's a wonderful thing to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But in the book of Luke, chapter number 3, it says that Adam was also the Son of God. In the Old Testament, it says plainly that Israel were sons of God. The scripture says plain in the Old Testament, the book of Job, that the sons of God rejoiced, shouted, when God created what he saw, what they saw, what burst forth before them, Barah, to come into existence out of nothing. In other words, the term son of God must be defined. You, you must define what you're talking about. What do you mean when you say son of God? Now the Apostle Paul and I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff here, but you know, a lot of this you've heard before. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 3.16 said, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. That's what most of the people carry to their churches with them. What does it say in your Bible? God. All right. Now what we've got to do then is to let the Jew define what he's talking about when he says God. In Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, one God. Classic term for that is monotheism, belief in one God. Believe in one God. Define your terms. On the Old Testament, a Jew said he's the Almighty. There is none beside him. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He is God. There's none above him. He resides in his own. In Exodus, he said to Abraham, to Moses, he said to Exodus, Moses in Exodus, I am that I am. Amen. That's a clear statement of his, of his self-existence and his eternity. 
All right? That's who they're talking about when they say God. Now, if I ask a Gentile to define the term God, he could see any, be anything. If I ask a Hindu, Hindu to, to define the term God, I could millions of gods. It could, it could be a concept with some. A New Ager, if I, if I ask a New Ager to define the term God, we go back to the Pleroma. We go back to what we were talking about with the Gnostics and all of that stuff. You know, so it gets into uh, what's called semantics. It's the definition of terms. What do you believe? What do you believe? This, that, and so forth. I mean anything. You've got to take the Bible. So what do I believe? I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. Amen. I believe that He is God Almighty manifested, became flesh. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. There's no misunderstanding that. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not a lesser God. He's not a created God. He is not an emanation. He's not an expression. He's not a phantom. He's not an idea. He is the very personal God of the Godhead. <coughs> Colossians 1 said, In Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. When you try to say these things, the reason you do is because it's necessary to lay a foundation for what you believe. Because for what I'm going to read for you in just a moment, from a so-called Messianic Jew, I'm going to show you the comparison between two of them. We have two opposing branches. And... Uh, <coughs> There's a lot going on today in the Messianic movement. Uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, I'm certainly no expert on them. But uh, I, I get a definite feeling from the spirit of this one group that they do know the Lord, that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. This other group, they don't have a clue who He is. And yet they call Him the Son of God. But watch the, watch the nuance, watch, the, watch, watch the, the shading of the meaning of the way they use the term. It's important, folks. It's very important. Words are important. All you got to do is change one word, and you've changed the meaning entirely. Now, uh, first of all, let me read what this group, this one Messianic group says. Uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'll show you some of the things that uh, you get, you, you get uh, that uh, you'll see the connection when I started, when I was talking to you before about, uh, about this Gnostic movement and how it's affected things. Now here's their statement. The Messiah would be more than a man. He would be God in human form. That's strong. That's what they say and give Scripture references to agree with that. They believe in the atonement. They believe in the blood atonement. <clears throat> they believe that salvation is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know if we'd agree with all the eschatology or not, but that's not what's important in here this morning. The important thing is who is the Lord Jesus Christ? That defines them because everything else is incidental as it relates to that. So they say that He is God in human form. All right. Now, this other group says this. They say the specific concept of a triune Godhead <coughs> originally derives from paganism. And Satan has established numerous alternative belief systems which incorporate the idea of a three-in-one God. For example, in Egyptian mythology, Isis was the daughter of Seb, the wife of Osiris, and the mother of Horus. Isis, Horus, and Seb are the mother, son, and grandfather. Although the Catholic Church offers other explanations, many scholars believe this is the real meaning behind the letters IHS, which are displayed so prominently in most mainstream Sunday churches. What do they do? They put a seed in your mind about where the idea of uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost came from. Now, by doing that, do you think they have much respect for the Apostle Paul? Now, don't you think about it for a minute. The Apostle Paul is unique. He's different. He was not one of the twelve. He came in later, and he was taken off into Arabia, 
And while he was in Arabia, it was there that God gave him the revelation of the mysteries. And when Paul came back, he came down, he went down to Jerusalem and he confronted the apostles. And in the book of Galatians, he says, I went down there to see whether or not I preached in vain and to see what they were preaching. What I had revealed to me in the desert, in the wilderness, I wanted to compare with what they were teaching in Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem is where Peter, James, and John resided. And here's this outsider, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, Pharisee. Here's this outsider all of a sudden because of a trip to Damascus. And uh, all of a sudden he's changed now and he's preaching the gospel that he at one time condemned. And so he went down there and confronted them. And he found out when he confronted them that the Judaizers had already infiltrated the church in Jerusalem. And there was a lot of problems developing from it. And even Peter had been affected by it. So now even from the 12 and even from the original, and Peter, of course, you know, some hold him to be the Pope and so forth. Uh, I don't. I don't believe in popes. I don't believe in priesthoods outside of the priesthood of the believer and all that. But uh, he, he, he had to deal with that. And, you know, he had a problem of being accepted. And Barnabas went with him from, from uh, uh, Antioch of Syria. And Barnabas was loved and respected by the apostles in Jerusalem. And so, therefore, on the, vo on the word of Barnabas, they were willing to accept him into their number. But they still eyed him with, uh, you know, they watched him, listened to him, see what he had to say. Paul's message was radical, folks, because the message of the Apostle Paul was the Jewish law is finished. It's over. Christ is the fulfillment of that law. And you cannot be saved by keeping the law that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believeth. And so his message, his whole message, his whole life, everything Paul fought for, stood for, believed and preached was about one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, obviously if you're going to be someone who drags people back under the law, you're not going to have a whole lot of use for Paul because he's, uh, yes. Pure Jews. Judaizers were Christians. Yes. But they were the ones who said a man had to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Yes. And in Acts 15, Peter and James both agreed with Paul that they didn't have to. Exactly. So put a yoke on them that our fathers weren't able to bear. And then told them what to do, abstain from meat off the idols and blood and so forth. Acts 16, Paul turns around and circumcised Timothy not to offend Jews. So there's kind of a I know that. A they did. Going on here. There is. It's not really as cut and dry. It's a transitional period. Yeah. It's a transitional period. Uh, which is a study in itself. But I want you to notice now what these people say here. They say that. What we should learn from this, after their treatise on who Christ is, what we should learn from this is that while we should worship Yeshua, and they don't like the word Jesus, they say the New Testament was written in Hebrew, and that Greek, the Greek New Testament you have is a translation from the Hebrew, which there's absolutely no uh, historical authority for whatsoever. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And Koine Greek is the Greek of the people, the common Greek of the, of, uh, of the street, pe of people that they spoke on the street. Now listen carefully. What we should learn from this is that while we should worship Yeshua, we must always remember never to pray to Him, but only to YHWH, and that's the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vau heh the sacred name of God. We should also never pray to any human being or to any being that is not Yahweh, and this is what they call him, the invisible father. For example, we should never pray to any of the apostles or to Miriam, Mary, and so forth and so on. Now, what's the subtlety in that statement? That Jesus isn't Yahweh. He's not Yahweh. Turn to Acts chapter 7 and verse 59. Acts 7, 59.
When I read this, this is the first thing. The Holy Spirit just popped it right in my mind. Acts 7, 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon who? God. Saying, Lord Jesus, Amen. receive my spirit. So who's he praying to? Yeah, he sure is. He's praying to Jesus. So should you pray to Jesus? If you want to pray to God, you better. <laughs> I mean, you see how I put that, don't you? <laughs> If you want to pray to God, you better pray to Jesus because He's God. Well, you know something? You'd be surprised at how many Christians, quote unquote Christians, that go to church every Sunday that do not really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. They believe He is just a little bit inferior to Him. And what they try to do is quote scriptures where He said, There is none good, you know, why callest thou me good? And statements like that that He said while He was here in the flesh. The Apostle says we no longer know Him after the flesh. That the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was here on this earth, humbled Himself and became obedient to the Father. He became subservient to the Father. He came to do the Father's will. He did not come to act as the second person of the Godhead. Everything He did, He did by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. When God gave Him the fullness of the Spirit without measure, and because of His obedience to the Father, so therefore, while he lived this earth for 33 and a half years, he lived it as a man full of the Holy Spirit of God. But he's still God. But he never did anything as God. Even the demon says, we know who you are. You're the Holy One. So who is Jesus? Here's what they say. That he is a manifestation of of Yahweh. All right. So what do they mean by that? You have to define your terms. I'm going to let them define it. Here, here they're going to define it for us. If Yeshua's manifested body was real, then what is manifestation? Manifestation is an agency relationship. Now watch this carefully. Since yod hey vow hey the Tetragrammaton, that's what they've got here, and they've got it in English letters, Y-H-W-H. Now watch this. Since Yahweh, the Father, is pure spirit, He does not wish to be defiled by coming into contact with the material world. Therefore, whenever He wants to do something on earth, He sends a malach, that's the Hebrew word for angel, or if the job is extremely important, he can manifest himself here in the material world, while at the same time not leaving his throne room. This is as much the same way as an earthly king, so forth and so on, sends a emissary. They just planted something in your mind. I hope you put the dot together. What we will see is that Yahweh can manifest himself as anything he desires, from a burning bush a torch, Yeshua, and other ways. For example, in Judges, the messenger who speaks with Gideon is called both Yahweh and a messenger of Yahweh. This is because Malak, messenger, is a manifestation of Yahweh that has been sent to deliver a message. So what have they done? How many times have you heard me say that the Gnostics believe that pure spirit, the Pleroma, you know, the One, will not be contaminated by touching anything physical. These people who call themselves Messianic Jews, and that's what they call themselves, Messianic Jews, are preaching Gnostic doctrine and trying to take Hebrew and spin it and make it look like it's something from the Old Testament when all along, all in the world they are, are a bunch of uh, Jewish Gnostics. That's all they are. Because pure spirit cannot touch physical, anything physical. All right. Everything physical, everything that exists came forth, issued forth from an invisible spirit being. It had its source in God. 
In Genesis 1 it says, Bara, Bereshith Bara Elohim. In the beginning God created. The word Bara means to bring into existence from nothing. So He brought it into existence. So where's the source of it? What does the Bible say the source of all physical created things comes from? Come from God. Well, Jesus, of course, is the creator there, but God in the sense that it came forth from that invisible spirit. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, look at Hebrews 1, folks, again now. Look at Hebrews 1. I know this stuff can kind of get, uh, uh, but this is what makes us what we are. If we can't deal with, uh, on the level that these people are talking about, that's when they come in and they say, oh, the Baptist church is a mine, gold mine, a place to, uh, uh, that we, can, that, that we can really do some evangelizing. Hebrews chapter number 1, God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. All right, here's the Son creating. Now it goes further. Watch the definition. Who being the brightness of His glory, who? The Lord Jesus and the express image of His person. Not a manifestation, an actual appearance. The personhood of God Almighty, that invisible being, was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He was not God making Himself known like a burning bush or like something that becomes divine. The Lord Jesus Christ was the very God of gods physically standing before them. There He was. And He's the express image of His person. And that word uh, express image literally means that the Lord Jesus Christ is God and man joined together in the incarnation. And that is a mystery to this preacher to this day and will always be a mystery until we see Him as He is. But I believe that God and man were joined together right. by the incarnation, by a virgin birth, Amen. by the seed that was sown by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary right. that did not originate from this earth, did not come from man, but came from heaven. Amen. The seed was sown in the, in the virgin's womb, and nine months later the God-man came forth on this earth. Right. That's, right. <coughs> That's what I believe. Amen. Now, uh, the Scripture says that He was the express image of His person. And the word translated person there is, uh, is what the King James translators tried to reach up and get a hold of and say, now what are we going to use here when we've got this Greek word hypostatic? And hypostatic is, re is, a, is, a, is a big technical term that refers to the merging of God and man, or the merging of spirit and flesh. It's called the hypostatic union. It's the coming together of the two. So was Jesus Christ man? Yes, He was man, but He was the God-man. Was Jesus Christ God? Yes, He was God, but He was the God-man. See what I mean by that? And He'll always be that, forever. So the Messianic, this Messianic, uh, these people who, who profess to be uh, 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 believers in God, and they profess to believe in Jesus, they believe in Him as the Messiah, and they believe in Him as the Son of God as they define the term. And you've got to watch these terms. You've got to watch it carefully. When somebody says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you say, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? If, if I say to you, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, I'll tell you what I mean. And if He's a true Christian, He won't hesitate to tell you. I've never seen a Christian who really loves our Lord Jesus Christ and studies their Bible that has any problem with believing that the Lord Jesus is God. I don't have any problem with that. I, 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 I see, I don't, uh, I've never seen that to be a problem. The fact of the matter is, every Christian I've ever known who really loves our Lord Jesus Christ, who's born again, f fights for words, tries to get a hold of as many words as they can to exalt Him as high as they possibly can. He's above everything. Amen. There's none like Him. Amen. You know, He's the only one of His kind. Amen. That's it. There's none like Him. So, uh, we can see that what little bit that I've done here this morning, that there is a vast difference in the Messianic movement. Some of them believe the Lord Jesus is a lesser God, a manifestation, an emanation, whatever, and some believe that He's God. 
then uh, which group do you think would be your brother and sister in Christ? <laughs> That's right. Now he uses the term, this group that believe that he's a manifestation, they use the term, I noticed this when I was reading this, over and over again, renewed covenant. Okay? The group that believe that uh, Lord Jesus Christ is God used the term new covenant. Amen. Which one's right? That's what the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews talks about, doesn't it? The, this group here that believe that Jesus Christ is God uses Bible terms. Over and over again they use Bible terms, atonement, redemption, uh, salvation, these terms that come from Scripture. This other bunch over here, they spin it and put their own spin on it, renewed covenant. All right? Is there anywhere in the Bible you can find the term renewed covenant? But what does it mean? Why would they use a term like that? Why would they use renewed covenant? Exactly. Exactly. It's just carried over now, uh, cleaned up, brushed off, and represented to the people. Renewed covenant. Not so. New covenant. This cup is the new what? In my blood. And when he said that, they were, they were observing the Passover that started in the book of Exodus. And he used that as a historical reference to the fact that the Passover prophetically pointed toward him. He was the fulfillment of it. And now he was establishing in the church of God what the covenant was about. The covenant is not the Ten Commandments given at Sinai to the church. That's not, we're based, we're not based on that. We love that, observe it, do the best we can to keep it. But that's not what we're built on. We are built on the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood sacrifice. That's what we're built on. And when you get to the book of Hebrews, as you know, you heard me say this time and time again. The Greek word translated covenant is diatheke. All right. Diatheke. Like a diameter. What's a diameter of a circle? Cuts through it, right? Circumference is the circle, the outside. The diameter means to cut through it. Diatheke means to cut through a new covenant. That's what it's talking about. So in the book of Hebrews, the word diatheke is translated covenant and testament. Why would they do that? Look at Hebrews 9 and you'll find out. I think it's verse 26. And we'll have to come to a close to run out of time. These little things like this are not little, they're big. When you, when you, uh, when you see what's going on here. What did, how is it translated when the Lord Jesus over there said, this is the cup of the new covenant? Did he say that? What? Did he call, what? Of course. But it's the word diatheke. Why do they call it covenant in one place and testament in another, see? All right, absolutely. It's, it's, all right. But the New Testament and the New Covenant fall under the same heading. They belong to the same thing. But why testament? You remember what I've told you before about that? If you pass on and leave behind, bequeath to your family members and friends and enemies, what a little bit you got. They'll come together, an attorney, a probate attorney will read the what? Last will and testament. That is yours when they're gone. It's bequeathed to you. It's given to you. It's a legal document. It says this is yours. So the diatheke is a covenant, but that covenant applies also to the Jew. See, this is the covenant that I will make with you, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, when I take away your sins. But the testament is specifically, it is based on the covenant, but it specifically is for you as the Christian believer that He has bequeathed to you, He has given to you. And look at the context of Hebrews 9. It's so important to get this. The testament is not in force without the death of the what? So when did the death take place? I mean, that's no brainer. When He died at Calvary. So when, his, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, He ratified, brought into being, made legal the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It became effective at the very moment that He died on the cross. And that's what happened. And that's why, they, that's why the King James translators, they could have used, they could have put covenant there in Hebrews 9, but they didn't. Yes, sir. Well, it's funny because the new funny Bibles, they use the word. <laughs> funny Bible. Uh, yeah. Uh, they use the word will instead of testament, yeah. but a will has to do with actual possessions, whereas a testament is dealing with something that's actually going to be given to you. 
far beyond what you have to possess. That's very true. And you don't have to possess a testament. Right. And if a covenant is a binding agreement between two or more parties. Absolutely. Where they come together and make agreement. The testament is a unilateral declaration. It's a declaration. It's a declaration. It, it just takes the word of the one making it. And uh, that's what Jesus did for us. Amen. He saved us without us knowing or agreeing. Hey, before I was ever conceived, the debt was paid. The, the issue was finished. It was done. All right. Well, we'll pick it up again next week. I wanted to give you just a little idea, a little view into the Messianic movement and let you know that we may not agree with a lot of things with these mess, some of these Messianic churches. And a point I make, make as clear as I can, now shut up. I know we're running out of time. The Bible said he hath made of twain one new man. There's no need for the Messianic movement to say that their church is different from our church. There's only one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. But if they want to retain their Jewish identity, good for them. God bless them. And that's fine with me. But there is no one church and another church and a Jewish church and a Gentile church. There's just one church in the body of Christ. Amen. Brother Roger Lee, will you dismiss us, please?